ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning, to be here at the YouTube channel with the IEA from the University of Sao Paulo. This was organized through the Zoom platform. So our guests of the morning, the panelists are all meeting here at the Zoom platform in this room. We've talked here. We've, we have exchanged some ideas. It's a bit complex, he says, because we have a simultaneous translation. We have three languages, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. We are located in four sites in the world. We are headquartered at the Advanced Studies Institute in Sao Paulo, Brazil. But we have Ana Rosas Montecon from Mexico, and now she's in Argentina. Today she's in Argentina. We also have Carla, Clara Camacho speaking from Lisbon in Portugal. And also in a different continent, we have Mutoni Tangwa speaking from Nairobi in Kenya. So we have different time zones, different experiences. So it, it's a whole mixed scenario, quite interesting scenario, by the way. So we have the channel available in English. We're gonna listen to the foreign perspective about the scenario of the museums and the cultural system here in Sao Paulo. So they made a reading for us of the uh, book that was launched this year jointly. This book is a partnership. It results from a partnership from the uh, Department of uh, Culture and Creative Economy, the CISM, that it's its museum system of the state of Sao Paulo. And Cam Portinari, Cam Portinari is the manager, the managing entity of some of the apparatuses of the state of Sao Paulo, uh, addressing different locations of the state of Sao Paulo. And since the beginning of the uh, Paulista meetings of uh, museums that are the uh, meetings organized for the state of Sao Paulo, organized by CISEN, by the uh, Secretariat of uh, Museums, we established this partnership and we started, you know, promoting the meetings. It's always a, a, a very, you know, thrilling uh, opportunity. We invite the reviewers, the youth, so that they can respond and establish their counterpoints of the uh, topics that we address. Well, it's been 12 years, there have been 11 meetings, and this gives us a quite interesting angle, which is a historical angle already, right? 11 years. Because on the condition of the museums under this very complex uh, cultural framework that is about not only the city of Sao Paulo, which is one of the largest cities in the world, but it's also about the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I will address this and I'll make a brief introduction after Ari Plonsk speaks, he's our director. It's a pleasure to have our director here this morning to welcome the speakers, the panelists, and of course the guests, this beautiful public that is listening to this. I don't know where they are. I don't know how they have managed, but they're here attending this event with us today. So this debate will be available on the external platform it's broadcast on the platform of the Advanced Study Institute, and it can be listened to at any point in time. So, Adi, on to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Professor Martin. Thank you. I would like to thank you and Diego from Forum Permanente, the permanent forum, as we call it here. Thank you for organizing this event on behalf of the Institute, this additional meeting and I'll briefly talk about the event. I would also like to thank the partnerships that you have established and that you have mentioned here. I would like to greet our three panelists. Well, you, Diego, cannot be blamed for something that upsets us, that is having panels with men. In this case, today, we have this whole panel with the women only. 
So we have this angle, this foreign perspective, but another perspective that is not always addressed, that is the women's perspective on the museums in Sao Paulo. They are professionals, they will provide us with a professional perspective, but this is important to mention as well that they are women. I would like to greet, not only following the alphabetical order here, Professor Ana Rosas Mantecon, Professor Ana Rosas gave us the privilege of, of visiting us last week. She was here live and in color, as we say here. So we were working with Professor Nestor Canclini. He's the head of the Olavo Setubo Institute of uh, Sciences and Art. That's another initiative that Professor Martin created during his term in the Institute. It's another effort that he coordinates. I would like to greet uh, Clara Camacho from uh, Portugal and uh, Mutoni Tangwa from Kenya. I have not, not yet met her, but I wish you all a great virtual participation here in our Institute's event. Professor Ana Mantecon, she's a witness. Uh, so uh, Professor Clara and Professor Mutoni, whenever you can come and visit us in 3D to visit us, you're going to be dearly welcome to visit us here in the Institute. And I would like to say finally, that it's important to have an external approach, a foreign perspective. So recently in Brazil, and it's not fair to generalize, but especially in the university, in the academia, we have a very parochial approach, a very local approach. We see what we do and we believe that we are self-sufficient in terms of our opinions. But specifically talking about the theme of this forum, getting a foreign perspective in all senses, and in this case, it's literally a foreign and external perspective from three professionals that are, of course, professionals and uh, sensitive to this topic and to the specificities of each region, the specificities of the museums in their regions, according to their history, according to the ethos of the society in which they are located. So it seems to me that it's a very important contribution to promote the advancement of humankind as a diverse collective group. So Martin, congratulations on the event. I wish you a fruitful event. And I apologize in anticipation because I'll have another meeting to attend. So I'll spend additional minutes with you, but then unfortunately I'll have to go. Thank you, Adi. We would like to thank you not only on behalf of the Permanent Forum, we would like to thank you for the partnership, for the support, and for being a partner with the Advanced Studies Institute here at the University of Sao Paulo. That has played a big difference here in our university arena and the academia to promote events with this nature, events of this nature. They are interdisciplinary event in their nature, but they also critically discuss the situation in the different fields of knowledge, not only regarding science, but also culture and arts. And I think it's fundamental to be interdisciplinary, to have an even more diverse interdisciplinarity. And this is what the Institute aims at promoting in uh, its different um, actions. So thank you so much. We thank you so much for the support of to the Institute. You know, be it, you know, technical support, knowledge dissemination support, and thank you for working together with us collectively. We should really highlight this point that working together is never easy. It's a big challenge, but when it works out fine, it's a great pleasure. It's a great achievement. And I see this in this situation that we are living right now. So I gave you a context on the production of the book. The book emerged because of this event, this event that is promoted by the Department of Culture of the state of Sao Paulo and also creative economy of the state of Sao Paulo. And it's had a long life and I hope still lasts so many years. And the forum with this, uh, critical coverage that has been happening 
since the first in 2009. So we were able to put together this critical uh, content that was edited as a book, that was published as a book. Well, we are recently more distant, but it enabled us, this distance enabled us to organize this uh, critical content to create many narratives. I believe that it's impossible to perform the full analysis of the book. And this morning, we are going to listen to their assessment, their reading. We are going to listen attentively to the three panelists on their report on the book. Oh, Ana was recently visiting us in Sao Paulo. So she's been in Sao Paulo other times. And I believe that Clara Camacho, she also has visited Sao Paulo. I don't know if Motoni Tangua has visited Sao Paulo, Brazil yet. I'm not sure. We'll hear from her when she speaks. Anyhow, even for those who live here, this uh, complexity of this metropolitan city and, and the complexity of the city of Sao Paulo and its with relationship the state with Sao Paulo. That is a state that has a richer Brazil based on the 19th century, as of the 19th century, leads uh, the country and has uh, participation in the political and the geopolitical structure of this young nation. And it's a boiler uh, full of uh, uh, things to be continuously explored and reminding us that IEA does that uh, very well because we have the cluster of researchers that uh, research the cities, that is the cluster of global cities and that keep this debate on the cities alive and on the situations and conditions it generates, bringing always some follow-up of what's happening currently in the city and its history. I think uh, I could be here taking a long time talking about Sao Paulo and about the situation, but I think that comments after the speeches from Ana Rosa Montecon and Clara Camacho, I think they will be much more profitable uh, as we consider uh, these evaluations. I would like to remind you that this mediation is going to be conducted by me and also by Renata Mota that will be with us in a few minutes. She had to go to an emergency meeting in her museum, but uh, she's gonna join us soon. And meanwhile, we would like to start with the speech of Motoni Tung, who's an anthropologist uh, that is graduated in Kenya and is like I've mentioned, is here with us directly from Nairobi and has an intense participation in the cultural relationships of her country with other instances in the world, especially through ECON, that is this uh, international body of museums that as of the Second World War, uh, has been structuring and allowing some interchangeable, interchangeable uh, communication related to museums. And, uh, ha and that ha has written lots of books and is someone that is very much interested in producing knowledge with this regard and reflections. So Mutani Tongwa, thank you very much for your, for your presence. I would like to give you the floor now so that you can start presenting us your considerations about the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. I am indeed very honored to be in a panel of very distinguished, happens to be ladies, 
which is also an additional pleasure. And uh, yes, you're right. I haven't been to Sao Paulo and I hope I can be there at some point because it's, it's really one of the most um, amazing cities. Uh, not least of all as portrayed uh, in some famous cartoon whose name I don't remember now, but really it's, it's, it's a beautiful uh, place by all I've heard. Uh, I would like to thank Forum Permanente and ICOM Brazil for this invitation. And of course, Martin and Sergio for all the coordination and ensuring that we understood what we were to bring on the table and you know keeping us updated with the dates and stuff. I really, really appreciate your efficient coordination. Um, I also am very pleased to meet Clara and Anna, and uh, I hope we can continue to work together on various things. Uh, because as Martin said, I have a long-standing interest in the culture and heritage sector in Kenya, in which I worked for very many years. And uh, ICOM Brazil invited me as the spokesperson of um, the 118 national committees of the International uh, Council of Museums. But uh, I'm an anthropologist by training and a Kenyan anthropologist who lives and works in Africa. So I will be able to give uh, some of the perspectives that can represent perhaps uh, a regional um, perspective on the book. So the first thing that I need to say is that within the time limitations, I know I have not done this publication any justice. And uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And um, I have chosen a few of the key points that I feel speak to the issues in Africa and speak to the heritage and cultural issues in my country as a sample of what is happening in the heritage uh, sector in, uh, in Africa. But I, I also realized that uh, a lot of work has gone into this because 10 years professionally can be a very long time, especially in terms of uh, policy formulation and, and interaction with our government. So I really, really want to present what 10 key points that I thought about or I came up with, but they are by no means uh, all that is in that book and uh, in the work that has been done by um, museums in Sao Paulo, which is just amazing. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Hmm. There we are. So for me, I'm completely um, amazed with this invitation and I really like it because it's part of what I would call a South to South discussion, which has been going on in the heritage sector for some time now. Because even um, ICOM has come to realize that there are certain things that uh, are experienced in Latin America and they're very similar to what's happening uh, in Africa and, and in, in uh, to, to a large extent in some places in Asia. So for me, it's this 11 years of the reflection and the policy issues in the cultural sector, though it's a case study of Sao Paulo, I love sharing through the eye of Africa with particular references, of course, to Kenya, where is, where, which is the country in which I've had the longest experience and where I've um, I've, I put my daily inputs. So that's the National Museums of Kenya. As I, as we've already said, my name is Mugani Sangwa and I'm a member of ICOM Kenya and uh, the spokesperson for 
the national committees of ICOM, including that of Mexico, Brazil. Of course, I, <laughs> when they say spokesperson, you think that I would even begin to manage the issues of a national heritage. I can't even manage this on my own, but never mind. They just give big titles. So what I've picked are learning opportunities from the Sao Paulo, San Paulo experience as presented in the book, 11 Years of Reflection and Discussion, the State of Sao Paulo's Annual Conference. And the first thing that uh, I felt really cannot be underrepresented is 10 years of continuous exchange of ideas and uh, different government administrations because cultural sectors everywhere in the world are um, challenged by one, the sector in which they are placed by the government. Sometimes you don't have a choice. And two, political changes tend to change the landscape in the cultural sector, especially in Africa. For example, in Kenya, when we compare with the 10 years of uh, the work that uh, Program Permanente has presented, in 10 years, we've had two different administrations, but within those 10 years, the heritage sector has been placed in almost six different government departments. So you can already see the challenge of starting any policy framework discussions or following them up because first we were in the Ministry of Gender, Youth, I think, and, and, and Culture, then at some point, we were even in the Ministry of Interior. At some point, we were together with prisons. Can you imagine? So, I mean, it's been so many transitions. So this creates uh, the sort of interruption in the policy framework that is very difficult to um, get continuity. So at the moment, we are under the Ministry of uh, Culture, Sports, and the Arts. Now, the biggest challenge about being the cultural and heritage sector being under such a ministry is actually the sports, um, the sports part of it. That is one of Kenya's iconic sportsmen, as uh, Paul Kipchoge. So he is so good that he's currently competing against his own timeline of uh, marathons in the world. He's the best in the world. And he's trying to beat his own, his own record. So you can imagine when culture and heritage are placed in the same government department as such iconic figures who are alive and you know are participating in things on a regular basis, not just nationally, internationally, the policy framework tends to get a back a backstage, especially for the cultural sector. So I am quite impressed that um, in Sao Paulo, you've been able to make, you know, like a, country, uh, a continuous pursuit of your policy uh, framework without interruptions. The other thing that really impressed me from the publication was uh, that you've created a network of actors from your own heritage sector who can work together organize professional activities and shape the direction of that sector, even if it's within uh, Sao, San Paulo. Of course, it's one of the largest cities in the world. So that's not a joke. It's an undertaking that is to be admired. And um, one that I must say we have not been able to do in Kenya and many other African countries because uh, we have one national museum system, which runs uh, 24 museums, 18 um, national uh, sites and monuments. But with the constitutional dispensation that Kenya undertook in 2010, we created the possibility of the 70, 47 counties having their own museums, but that has not happened because uh, nationally we have not quite been able to implement all the different aspects of the devolution of the new constitution. 
And I know for a fact that this is uh, a challenge that ex exists in many African countries, such as Nigeria, which also has many states. So each state has its own museums, but national coordination or, or even county coordination presents so many challenges. So the network that you have created is of great importance and something that we can learn and even borrow from. So I was amazed to hear there are 500 museums in Sao Paulo. I mean, compared to our, in Nairobi, we only have five. So you can imagine, I, I, I just read the document with uh, total amazement. And as I said, in our 47 counties, not a single county has yet established its county museum or state as you would call it in your system of government. That is in spite of having communities that have spaces that they call museums. We have uh, several communities that have uh, museums like the Maasai community have a Ma museum. We have Kipsigis museum, but these have not been taken under a national umbrella or even recognized by their own counties because the registration in these places has not been done. So you can see that uh, in terms of the policy framework, you might think that you're challenged, but you're quite ahead of uh, your contemporaries in Africa. We also have memorial spaces that act like museums. This is the over seven memorial park that uh, is a memoriam of the the unfortunate incidents that happened in 1998 when Kenya had um, um, a terrorist bomb and at the American embassy. So that space was made into a park that also serves as a museum, has exhibitions. Now, the interesting thing is that it's not part of the national museum systems. It runs as a private entity. And um, even if Nairobi holds museum meetings, they would not be included. That's just how fragmented the, the heritage sector in, in, in our country can be. We also saw, I was so impressed by the resilience of the sector in uh, Brazil because uh, heritage and culture is often underfunded and in competition with other national sectors such as education, health, of course, we know what sectors end up getting the funding. So for Forum Permanente and, and the creative economy sector and the, you know, and, the, and the government in Sao Paulo to be able to follow this through a 10 year period where you have progressively chosen different themes each year is also a, a very, very important learning point. It's also a very important learning point actually for the International Council of Museums because we, we also spend a lot of time thinking of uh, the themes for our national conferences, for our every the triannual get together, International Museums Day. And sometimes you find that um, because there are so many countries represented in ICOM, each country has a different idea of what it should be, but you guys have been able to get 500 institutions to sort of agree, develop and go forward with things. And that is something that is, is, is quite impressive. So I'd like to congratulate all the professionals who've you know, taken this commitment to work and ensure that this goes through because it can present um, a very, very important case study internationally especially also in um, for us people in the so-called global south, because I think we have less resources for culture and heritage and the arts than perhaps other places in the world. Also the, that act of sharing information it's, it's, it's a point of growth, exchange, and focusing on the diversity of heritage experiences that museums exist to serve and promote. So what happens is when museums don't work together, sometimes you, um, what do I say, you put energy into the same efforts. Whereas 
if I'm a museum of natural history, I can deal with that and then exchange ideas with the museum of culture or with the museum of, but when there's no, when there's lack of that coordination, you'll find that uh, a lot of efforts are put in, but the results may not be as impressive as what uh, Forum Permanente and, and the other players in this um, initiative have been, uh, have been able to do. So that's, that's also something that I found to be quite impressive. That, for example, is um, Fort Jesus, one of the biggest uh, national monuments in Kenya. It's at the coast. Um, Fort Jesus as a monument is, um, is, is a partner, or ideally should be a partner to other monuments at the coast. But because it's run by the national museums, it tends to act like a uh, a solo, so I'd say a solo player. And then when you look at, at like the visitation, as you can see in the picture, there are museums, such as um, a monument tends to have so much going on that the time for exchange, and then somebody deliberately goes out of their way to make sure that there's time for exchange with uh, other professionals and, and contemporaries and different kinds of institutions then they only develop things that are important to a physical monument. I was also quite impressed by the political support you've been able to get because I read in the document that uh, uh, the mayor and you know um, uh, various directors have been able to join and support this initiative because support, whether it's political, national, regional, can transform the culture and heritage sector. It also enables borrowing and implementation of standards such as those set by ICOM. And to give uh, a Kenyan example, recently we were able to work with our colleagues in Tanzania and other uh, uh, Swahili speaking African countries, and we translated the code, the code of conduct for ICOM into Swahili. And I can tell you that this, this, this uh, regional support has generated an immense and renewed understanding of the code of conduct. So you find somebody who speaks Swahili, maybe is um, a, a manager of collections and, and, and in a museum. They have read the book, but because it was in a language that didn't speak to them, when they see it in Swahili, they read it and say, oh, this is what they meant by point three, point one. So you find somebody has worked in the museum sector for 10 years, 20 years, they've read this book numerous times, but the minute you get support to take a step in the right di direction, direction, even linguistically, and exchanging that information amongst yourselves then creates a whole new understanding of and for the sector. Uh, it has also come out in your publication that you have implemented a public-private partnership, and that also is a very important point to influence the heritage and cultural sector anywhere in the world, especially in Africa. As I said, uh, in many African countries, like for example, in Tanzania, we have what you call the Village Museum and all these other community organizations that are working as museums, but they lack a model to coordinate with the government. Yet we know that one, uh, one of the institutions in any country that has uh, funding, has access to, can provide opportunities, can provide um, a calm environment to work is the government. So when you find uh, institutions in the heritage and culture sector are not in coordination with the government, then it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge because if you think about it, our communities are the basis of the heritage or they are the foundation of the heritage that we, the, the, the professionals uh, want to manage. And then also the trickle down effect forms a strong foundation for the management of any heritage in a, in a nation. 
I was thoroughly in, impressed by the state register for museums. Wow, that's like a really nice way for the government to make a permanent uh, commitment to the sector. Because um, I know after Kenya promulgated the 2010 constitutions, we attempted to form um, an institution that would regulate museums and that would register all these museums, uh, whether they be private collections, community museums, religious sites, or just formal museum institutions. And I know that uh, the baby is yet to be born. And uh, it's been what, since 2010, we haven't even created like, you know, a register. Like if you want to know all the uh, community museums in Kenya, there is no national register where you can just go and, you know, check it out and find out where they are. But that's the dream. So when you guys say that you already have that, I'm like, oh, wow, good job. You're ahead of us, but we're going to catch up. So the possibility remains for Kenya, but uh, the sector is still quite uh, fragmented in terms of uh, creating a central database. And then the inclusion of heritage and the cultural sector and strategies for socioeconomic development, whether it's a town or a city, is one of the best initiatives I have read in the book because if um, I, I don't understand why governments would consider the culture and heritage sector not to be part of the development of the town or the nation, because what we do in the heritage sector really is for the country. We're, 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 we don't own this heritage. We don't, we, we don't really benefit from it. It's the nation that benefits from it. So we're just custodians or the keepers of it. So how it is not integrated into the socioeconomic development. For example, I don't know about uh, Brazil, but in Kenya, you often hear, oh no, we don't have funding for that sector because we are funding health, we are funding education. But what is a museum if it's not educating the nation? So I, I, I was quite impressed to hear that you created some sort of uh, an inclusive uh, strategy in your policies in the city that includes uh, the, the heritage sector as well. Um, the other thing that I really think sometimes we miss as museum professionals, sometimes we, we give our contribution many times for free, many times with a lot of dedication. What we don't realize is that this contribution forms the foundation stones of managing heritage in the sector. For example, in, I read a lot of the people who gave a preface thanked somebody. So they said, thank you this person, thank you that person. And for me, these are all people in the heritage sector who've given their time, probably their resources very selflessly. Uh, because um, I don't know about South America so much, but in Africa, Whenever there's somebody really giving, it's, it's something to do with um, uh, inheritance from our colonial uh, powers, like you need to thank this person or that person, and they're always maybe donors, maybe development partners, but the contribution of the local professionals, I think, is one of the most important things that I have read from the book and that everybody is thanking this and that person. So it is local players. And I think that really creates a very, very uh, vibrant sector with ethos and personal responsibilities. Well, sometimes in the context of sacrifice, but that is the way to make a contribution in our sector, I believe. And then um, I realized that you're able to change your policy uh, framework pretty first because now you said that the conference is hybrid because uh, a lot of the times in the heritage sector, we tend to get caught in, oh, you know, we, we haven't thought about how we can do this online. So we need time, let's have a workshop. And But you seem to have created um, a policy framework that is very flexible, that is very versatile. So when COVID came, 
you were able to continue with this initiative uh, using the online uh, part. And in addition to that, what we are discussing today, the publication that is the result of your work is so important because even if you stop today or tomorrow, and I know you will not, other people can read the work that you have done and see the initiatives and see the different things that you have done in the 10 years. And that creates a very, very important foundation for whoever will be in the sector tomorrow to, to, to be able to build or to continue building what has already been started. The fact that you've thought of sharing this internationally, uh, even outside of South America, and, and, and I hope in future you can share it with more Africans and other Europeans. I'd, I'd particularly want Europeans to be as impressed as I am by the kind of initiatives that are going on in, in your country. So it, it's, it's so important because one, it challenges us, uh, the museum uh, players in our own countries. And we feel that if um, Brazil can be able to do this, then even Kenya can be able to do this. And that will encourage also professionals. And it will serve as a reference point where we are able to say, mm -hmm, don't postpone it because Tell you what, Brazil has been organizing this for 10 years. So we can, for example, in Kenya, we started an annual um, curators conference, but it only ran for four years. So we, we, we used to have uh, every year curators come share experiences. It was also in an effort to create uh, some sort of uh, policy framework but after a while, when, when, when the department that, when we changed, when the government changed the department that was running museums, it went to a different department, then the initiative seems to have been lost, the funding is lost. So I, I can only say that um, this idea of an annual conference and a publication is really very good, actually quite excellent. I also noted in the publication that, um, yeah, the, somebody mentioned about the ethical challenges of gender inclusion. Those are everywhere, not just gender, religious, sometimes even cultural. Um, and well, the, we, we have to be museums, have to wake up to the reality of the changing cultural scenarios in the world. What is amazing is that in Kenya, the art sector, which in many ways is looked at differently from the museum sector, even if they are very related and work closely together, is way ahead of this. And they, they, they are sort of very free to discuss anything, anything, even when, for example, um, being gay is banned in law in Kenya, but the art sector discusses it freely in their paintings, in their uh, in the theater performances, in, in you know, poetic presentations, in political demonstrations. And yes, our sector has to, especially the museum sector, really has to catch up. Uh, that's a picture from one of Kenyan artists. You see the way he's presented, you know, he's talking about saving water, which probably a museum is a theme of the museum would love, but the way he presents it, <laughs> shower together. So the, the, the art sector has created all these things that are not um, tied down in encumbrances of policy or, you know, presentation which I also noted that you have uh, raised the issue in the uh, Brazilian sector. And then last but not least, I would just like to share a video from uh, for Jesus. Not so much because it uh, affects the book in any way, but because I felt that I needed to bring a bit of Kenya to, to the table so that you see some of what uh, perhaps we do.
So I hope that makes you want to come to Kenya and join us and enjoy that. Uh, Asanteni sana, gracias. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't taken more than more time than I was allocated. Thank you very much for listening. Mutoni, uh, thank you so much for your uh, amazing presentation. Uh, you 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 brought to us um, uh, eleven considerations. So we this will be guiding us in our debate after <clears throat> each talk. I. I really once again thank you for 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 this and uh, also i will mention that uh, we have henata with us now so henata mota if you want to say hello uh, but the idea is that maybe uh, in the end we uh, after um, uh, clara's and anna rosa's uh, uh, presentation you you could maybe uh, try a wrap up uh, i will help you with that so we can start a, a debate uh, amidst us. Hi, Renata. Bom dia, boa tarde, obrigada, uh, Martin. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Martin. We'll do that. Okay, então, uh, mudo para o português. Uh, eu... So now I'll be switching to Portuguese, and uh, Clara Camacho will begin with her presentation. And once again, I would like to thank you for your contribution speaking from Lisbon and Portugal. You are three hours ahead of us in the time zone. So I think uh, Kenya is way ahead of time. And this has to do with the world, right? Mutoni, yes, Mutoni is like seven hours ahead of us. Yes, yes, it's five o'clock in Kenya. <laughs> so you are way ahead of us. You are the forefront, right, <laughs> in our discussion here. So now let's hear from, from Clara, three hours ahead of Sao Paulo time. So Clara, on to you. Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, Martin and uh, Renata. It's a pleasure to be here in this panel with Mutoni and Anna. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. I really uh, appreciate the invitation. It was a quite challenging and quite interesting to prepare this contribution in the, for this round table. So I will uh, introduce a variation between the two panelists. I'm not going to use a PowerPoint. I'm going to speak freely using my notes here and my remarks after reading the book. And if you allow me, I would like to begin with the two personal notes. The first has to do with my professional uh, relationship, my personal and institutional relationship with Brazil. It's been more than 10 years that I've had this relationship with Brazil. Well, that was this uh, phase of the uh, history of Brazilian and Portuguese museology. Well, it lasted for a few years and then the national organisms dealing with museums, both in Brazil and Portugal, they got close together, they operated together. And then I had uh, the uh, possibility to participate in this uh, moment of development of public policies as a coordinator of the Portuguese network of museums and also as the uh, director of the uh, Portuguese Institute for Museums as well. And as a, the coordinator of the network of museums, I visited Brazil for the first time in 2004 to attend the National Forum of Museums in Brazil. It was an unforgettable experience to me because I was able to experience from inside out and see the enthusiasm. It's really utopic, it was utopic, in a moment that was uh, very much favorable for the design of museum policies in Brazil. It was uh, quite inspiring. I was inspired by museology in Brazil and I brought to Portugal practices, examples and reflections uh, that were a reason for debate to us in Portugal. On the other hand, well, I was taking into account uh, both sides. 
and there was the experience of the Portuguese Institute of Museums that, that played a high influence in uh, creating IBRAD, our institute. Well, I think it makes sense to highlight that in some uh, cyclical moments in the uh, development of museology policies within the many countries, Portugal and Brazil got united. They worked together uh, towards common interventional projects. It was a great privilege to be able to participate in 2007 in the meeting that was held in Salvador that really uh, created programs for museums and it originated the Salvador letter. And then a few years later, we also participated in the UNESCO meeting held in 2015. We had a very important role of IBRA and this led to the approval of the uh, recommendation for the uh, protection of the uh, collections, the museological collections and the role of the museum in societies. And in this meeting, Portugal and Spain were aligned strate strategically with the uh, colleagues from the Latin American countries instead of being aligned with the European countries. Well, the rest of the European countries, they had a bit, uh, you know, different positioning about this. And then on a personal note, what I would like to bring to you, it has to do with my relationship with Sao Paulo. Made comments and observations in this meeting. And fortunately, the two previous times that I had to do that with regard to the city of Sao Paulo and the museums and the University of Sao Paulo. And it was precisely the last time I was in Sao Paulo four years ago uh, to talk about this relationship about uh, UNESCO. Uh, we discussed the polemical things regarding uh, the exhibits and everything that happened at MASP. Uh, so the, as a consequence, we had this book that was is launched today. And also the prologue of this book. Uh, at the time, I did not know what was going to happen next uh, regarding to the state uh, museum system, I followed up from far the, the achievements and I cannot forget to mention the conversations and the message exchanges that we had with Luis Nizucam. Uh, and also recently with, and more recently with Renata around the course about museums, uh, museum networks. And now I'm here again, and I can reaffirm that that in Sao Paulo I and the issue of this book of 11 years of uh, reflections and discussions on the on Sao Paulo museums, I would like to uh mentioned that i did not know about the presentation presentation that i could have brought we had not agreed about anything with this regard so i was surprised that you brought presentation so i didn't bring one but i agree with you that uh what you have already said uh, makes my test really easier now because there were several topics that called my attention and i had so to say some attraction to explore these topics regarding the networks uh, the topic of management of museums that is another topic that has pretty much connected over the past, I was pretty much connected to over the past two years with a project called uh, Museums of the Future. 
that I was working with and that I had to gather recommendations for the museums for the next years by all the way till 2030. And also a topic that, which is also a topic that I've been working with uh, lately, but the central topic, which was exactly the continuity of the policies. This was the subject that called more my attention and that I decided to give priority here during my, my speech. I think that Martin himself and Diogo and uh, also, and Diogo Kirkesh and Diego, they affirm that it's uh, not a surprise that the policies, uh, the cultural policies are submitted to the transition of the policies of the government because this has been happening for 10 years uh, with the representativeness in the museums of Sao Paulo. So uh, we understand this, this continuity of public policies uh, will be shown in perspective as they are historical aspects regarding uh, the subject. A little bit further ahead in the book, Martin mentions six factors. It says that uh, what things that can justify the continuity of this state policies, uh, complementary policies, a technical body and their institutional programs related to the historical organization, the interchange of knowledge and the encounters uh, uh, that are conducted over the internet and the promotion of a floating platform that is uh, the extraordinary permanent forum that will entail this possibility in this uh, very rich digital platform. In another part of the book, uh, Claudinelia Ramos uh, mentions five reasons for the longevity of this uh, reflections. The professional dedication, the dedication of the professionals in the system, the unity of the work presented, uh, the entity uh, Paulista and, and Brazilian ones that are included, and also the Secretariat of the Culture that is also responsible for all that. So it is around these two topics that I would like to discuss a little bit. Is an area that is in, of interest to me that simultaneously with the observation of public policies, uh, just as we have in Portugal, and the factors of continuity and disruption. In general, the factors that were mentioned here, they are similar to those that I have been observing in the implementation of public policies. In my observation in Portugal, we to find a set of eight factors that can help explain the temporal continuity are two that are uh, related to the design of the policies themselves. One is the, the state of the art interrelational that is followed up by a diagnosis of characterization of the reality. So it's a strategic program and the willingness of applying proper policies, another very important aspect that uh, brings together the topic of political leadership and other factors with uh, an institutional framework that gives it foundation of course, involving the agency, the agents of uh, the public sector. 
sometimes one only one of these factors is enough to hinder all the system and the continuity of the policies on the other hand the movement of the policies of the state and the reforms of the state uh, engine can impact the institutional aspect this has happened in portugal when the institutes of the museums was extinguished to give place to the new direction of the uh, state assets with uh, with an idea of saving costs after 10 years we see that we, this decision was very bad for the sector also in 2019 in portugal we had reforms political reforms pedro adão e silva e ricardo paes neto they concluded there was a trend in deep reforms that would be would disrupt what had been done in the past and change the priorities the authors on the other hand they understood that the problem of the public policies in portugal had more to do with the quality of the design processes and of implementation than with the lack of reforms these authors they they argue that uh, the problem of these policies uh, entail a common alignment that needs to be reached in the evaluation of the decisions that are made. They consider that there was an, uh, uh, the lack of a domaining policy in Portugal that would serve as a guideline for the reforms a long time and that provide more if less efficiency and generates a lot of waste so these things can also be applied to the paulista encounter meeting of museums uh i think that andrea matarazzo mentioned that too she said a great merit of this is more on the news than and more less on the news and more on the continuity of the processes that have been applied in portugal if the policies are showing are proving to be efficient why should we change them but how can we assess if they are being efficient uh, through the impact that these museums have on society so once these premises have been presented i think that we should bring together a list that was presented by Claudinella to factors that are documental and that can base the continuity of policies that have proved to be efficient. The primary one is to is the assumption of the cultural approach in face of the public aspects and the common the society communities in society. The other is the replacement of the profitability of culture that is fundamental that democracy is not seen as a specific dimension of the political aspect but as something that is fundamental for all the other social factors and uh, and where the different dimensions and institutions can be included the cultural democracy implies in the in new relationships between institutions and communities and culture as an open space for every citizen needs the participation of everyone and this paradigm also entails the change in behavior and judgment it refuses to consider minor the public efforts and valuing the traditions and the best conditions. So with that, we had a document that was approved in Portugal. And this document reflects many practices that have already been implemented, and especially in Brazil and in Sao Paulo. 
And in the European area, this document is a guide, like a light to guide uh, the policies, the speeches, and the cultural practices with concrete documentations for uh, the leaders and politicians and leaders of cultural organizations. The second factor that I would like to introdu introduce is to highlight the importance of the social impact of the actions and initiatives uh, that are in the political framework. If it's a priority of the policies of, of the countries that uh, have uh, English language, like the United Kingdom uh, and in the South, if the uh, southern countries in Europe, like Portugal and in Latin America, they, we only have rare examples of an, of an evaluation that is commutative, that provide information and analytical basis for the design of uh, political structures. So not only in Europe, but also in other world geographies, we see the impact, the social impact of the museums as an asset for the population. And the, we, we also have in, in the Catalan museums a barometer to assess the importance of these museums, but we need to look externally and use uh, appropriate metrics and un to understand what is being done to solve problems in these communities and how they are helping the governments and what are the positive impacts that are being achieved. They are basically the questions that move us for those who work with museums, for with people and for people. In terms of the social parameter of museums, we the vision is to amplify the social impact that benefits society as a whole and that give public value and transform the reality and the dynamics of society. Also in Portugal, with regard to uh, the plan of the arts, we are designing an object around the commitment of the social commitment of the, the cultural organizations to improve the relevance of these organizations. And with that, in my, in my first intervention, I don't want to, you know, go over time, but my words are in the sense of suggesting an appropriate evaluation of the impact of the museums integrating the state uh, uh, system in Sao Paulo as a tool to guide us in the next steps that we need to adopt in the public policies for museums in the state of Sao Paulo. And in addition, also, I would like to discuss and open for a debate so th and also to answer questions that you might have. Thank you. Clara Camacho, Thank you very much for your attentive and critical contribution. Very interesting to follow with you in the scanning that you did also, especially choosing a topic that uh, uh, in addition to the others, not that the others are not important, but it was interesting that as you mentioned, uh, uh, and Mutoni herself also emphasized this issue regarding continuity of the continuity of cultural policies, be them private or public. And in this case, you made these considerations that will for sure help us uh, expand this debate after Ana Rosa speaks. I apologize for not having introduced you, but I would like to say that we have two anthropologists and uh, the the person in charge of the history that is uh, Ana Rosa, uh, 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 Ana, uh, Clara Camacho. Uh, you have a incredible curriculum 
both as a professor and as a manager of private tools and museums and your active participation, just like you said in your introduction, not only with public policies for culture, but obviously to the related areas like education, for example, and of your importance uh, both in Portugal and here in Brazil. And creating this uh, Ibero-American link that has been making a difference in discussions that are not only local, but also regional and global. With that, I would like to introduce uh, Ana Rosas Mantecon, that is an anthropo cultural anthropologist uh, connected to Universidade Autonoma Metropolitana in Mexico. Uh, and also very well mentioned by our director, uh, Grant, that ha was here in Sao Paulo with uh, uh, the principal of art, art, science, and culture. And we are still amazed of, uh, with the possibility of having you here in Sao Paulo at this moment that we that the pandemic has slow down a little bit. Uh, of course, that it's was still not uh, in the normal uh, world, but in this moment, we have a re-energizing moment uh, with this uh, social contact uh, for this uh, uh, possibility of exchanging knowledge and working interchangeably through Zoom. And, and of course, we cannot compare with an in-person uh, exchange. Well, uh, yeah, it's like a joint experience as we had last week. So your work is dedicated um, to uh, cultural development. So there are many audiences, and this is something very important to the Forum Permanente. Diogo, one of the authors of the book, Diogo Moraes, he is an artist, and as an artist, he has been addressing the many audiences. So his master's degree was at the University of Sao Paulo with us. And he makes a quite accurate uh, reading of the uh, participation of the institutions and, and the cultural framework, as uh, Dr. Carla Carmacho highlighted. That is the importance of taking into account a cultural democracy, not only democratizing culture, not only this, so Anna also has this focus related to the museums, but also the dissemination of culture in other expression formats, like the movie theater, like the cinema. So Anna, once again, thank you for being with us here. Thank you for the possibility of uh, continuing to exchange information with you. I'll turn it over to you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Martin. It has been a pleasure for me to get to know the entire material that you have generated and participate in this. So I'm going to share my screen now. Well, from the first time that I visited Brazil, Something that really struck me deeply was the opening of the uh, Brazilian anthropology to the world. Well, throughout the years, I attended conferences and I participated in different kinds of events with many audiences, many types of audiences. So I was really, uh, you know, enticed by the opening of the academic sector in Brazil. And my first major surprise, it wasn't actually a surprise to me, but something that supported this was the meeting that I had. Well, when I encountered this book about the uh, Sao Paulo meetings on museums and the permanent forum, but this really supports the opening that you have to the world. And then it resulted in the book, this uh, work of art, uh, before we had the digital platform, 
And this meant the possibility of uh, continuing to reflect throughout another decade. Uh, it seemed to me that this was a polyphonic work. Polyphonic means that it was a work in many senses. So first we had uh, the critical reviews in the uh, Sao Paulo meetings, but we also had the wealth of uh, reading materials, images and videos that we could share in this platform. So there was a huge effort in nurturing a public policy to promote culture which is beyond the museum system. Of course, that is a great effort that we gear because uh, theoretically we consider the evolution of the themes that we address, but there is also a methodological effort. Well, it's a whole journey and I'm going to focus on the audiences and the publics that we serve. So I'm just going to show to you the wealth of the discussion, the methodological discussion. And these are resources to professionalize and also to address the many possibilities to address this area in a critical fashion. One of the uh, greatest wealth, one of the greatest wealth of the material is the ability of sharing, exchanging, questioning. And we are continuously uh, enthused about this. We, we consider the theoretical, the political debates, the international experiences and the experiences of the Sao Paulo museums, things that are challenged year on year, thanks to the meetings. So in the meetings, we find experimentation, assessment, readdressing, revisiting the strategies. Well, and this often when you cover the successful experiences, but we also address policies that did not work and we aim at learning from them. These policies were not debated sufficiently. And something that was quite rich, in my opinion, is that we have this whole framework of conversations and discussions and materials. We have you know, written and visual materials as well. And everything is based on the uh, cooperation between arts and institutions. And we don't see that happening between the academic and cultural institutions as anthropologists. Of course, uh, we acknowledge the approach of the many academic fields, uh, but there is no permanent dialogue with the field of culture. In this sense, we have been able to build bridges because of the continued efforts, the generation of materials and dialogues. And this will only enrich, undoubtedly, it will enrich not only the museums, but it will enrich the academic reflection because it is in the dialogue, in the dialogue with the sectors that we can generate new questions, we can pose new challenges, we can revisit and readdress the sense of the investigation in promoting a dialogue with the context itself. So I'm going to focus, given the uh, short time that we have to address this topic and then promote a debate between us. So I'm going to focus on social inclusion. As Clara was mentioning, this topic is in the core of the uh, concerns of the museums. Well, I covered and I read the book based on the uh, reports uh, that I heard about the uh, social inclusion. But I saw many of the materials that we find in the platform and then they follow different paths. There are many uh, perspectives. This polyphonic perspective is what's magical because it identifies four major areas for the theme of social inclusion. There is a whole set of uh, debates on how to define it. And this includes the social approach of the museums, the social role of the museums. We see the terms of the debate and the many other areas in which we ask, who are the audiences? Uh, what kind of uh, audience 
can we address to talk about inclusion or to promote inclu inclusion? It's not only a theoretical debate or a political debate, it is a methodological debate on how to implement this. And this encompasses a whole set of museums that has to put inclusion in their core. And it seems to be part of the wealth, the richness of this discussion to consider how the museums can contribute to the uh, transformation of the uh, surrounding fields, the social transformation as well. And then consider how all processes will impact the museums themselves, how they transform the museums and how we transform the process of mediation with the museums. For example, when the museums address the theme of social inclusion. The dialogue and the Sao Paulo debates, they are contributing and they're bringing to the fore of our concerns the idea of the uh, paradox that is the muse museum institution. Museums are institutions and in the core of their emergence, they deal with the uh, democratizing of access. The museums, they emerge posing the claim of the public use. Before we had the church, the courts, we had the bourgeois do playing the role to serve the social demands. We have the French Revolution in the origin of the museums, but we also have the Industrial Revolution in the origin of the museums. The aims to address all of these uh, connections and putting them at the service of broader sectors. The uh, creation of the institutional museums will uh, transform the access to the uh, collections differently from what we had before. The museums were serving the sectors that had a deep relationship with the church, with the bourgeois only. But then new possibilities are opened so that uh, the general public can go and visit anonymously. And this happened as of the second half of the 18th century. So everybody starts enjoying the repertoire of the museums. So uh, the notion of audience is linked to the notion of anonymity because the audience, the public is a sector that doesn't need to belong to be there, to have access, because the assets, they're all public. They all have become public assets. So the museums, they were, you know, becoming institutions so that they could be open to everyone truly. So throughout the 19th century and throughout the 20th century, we see the opening of the museums, formally open to all of the audiences. So we have the formal opening and there is this idea of formal opening because yes, the museums are open to everyone. They have emerged as key institutions to democratize, democratizing access. So what we now see in the center of the debate in the last two or th three decades, we see the acknowledgement that the museums have also become uh, you know, spaces for reproducing inequalities. So there is this discussion of the required connection of the museums with the social surroundings. So this is a questioning that we pose because sometimes the museums may be reinforcing inequalities. The first uh, great moment is when we believe that we have to intervene in the cultural institutions so that we can democratize them so that effectively they can topple the barriers to access. Well, this happened midway through the uh, 20th century with the first uh, Ministry of Culture. There was the French Ministry of Culture that started addressing this. We need to develop public policies to build bridges between the cultural institutions and the many audiences, the many publics. So they began identifying the many barriers, the barriers that had to be overcome. And these barriers are related to the economic capital. They have to do with the geographical distances, but also with the cultural and the social social distances. So the core of democratizing culture 
was uh, based on developing tools, the tools that are required to provide access to the many audiences. Well, the definition of museum dated uh, from 2006 uh, by IFA is really including social inclusion at the core at the definition of museums. So we have to consider that. And we see that clearly in the Sao Paulo meeting of museums, we see that in all of the materials that address this topic of social inclusion, and this is available in Forum Permanente as well. So we acknowledge uh, the, uh, the difficulty of access to lower income populations, the indigenous populations, uh, the African descendant populations, the disabled populations as well. So then we have the paradigm of democratizing access. We have to identify and fight against the factors that lead to cultural exclusion. We have to take into account what social inclusion means to museums, because the museums, the institutions, the cultural institutions define who has access to the institutions themselves. So we need to educate the public, the audience. Uh, we need to see them as receptors of the uh, museum assets. So the museums debate with themselves what they should do and how they should be more open. And based on that, uh, there must be policy development. Well, there have been many panels and the book also shows that, and this can be seen in the platform of the Sao Paulo museums. We see the incorporation of different notions on cultural inclusion policies. So we see the uh, definition in the Helsinki meeting in 1972. Beyond uh, democratizing tasks, we have to revisit the uh, cultural democracy model. We have to question the role of the museums and the uh, legitimizing of the uh, heritage. heritage. The idea is not only considering a set of uh, repertoires that are held by the museums. The idea is considering how we can also take into account and question the shaping of the repertoires, the development of the collections. Who do they represent? Because the inclusion is not only have, having access to museums, and the access of many sectors to the uh, cultural heritage that was developed. But we have to consider whether this cultural he heritage represents all of the social sectors. So what does that mean? It means that the museums, they should be open up to the many expressions of creativity that can include the arts, the professionals, because they address the public, they address the audience, not only as consumers, but they are the active creators of culture with whom the cultural institutions must establish a dialogue as well. And in order to shape up this dialogue, the first point is multiplying our notion of audiences. Well, the, the museum audience is not a signal audience, we have to recognize the multiplicity of sectors that have access to the museum, and we have to identify them. In all of the uh, materials that we see in the platform, it's clear that we identify a growing interest in Brazil on the audience studies. But at the same time, we recognize the fact that many museums, they do not know about their visitors. They do not know who visits them. There is no theoretical or methodological discussions on how to identify the many communities, the many publics and audiences. Getting closer to them, not only the public that has access to the museums, the effective ones that visit them, but also considering the surrounding communities of the museums. And this encompasses everyone that we do not see in the museum, people that we cannot interview, but they are part of this fabric. They are part of the surrounding community near the museum. Sometimes they're even far away. So, well, this is a concern that we should have in the museum system. That is who, how can we identify the visitors and how can we generate these specific actions to meet their diversity needs? 
So when we consider the types of audiences that we are talking about, the most uh, clear ones are the, the ones that visit us, actually the presence-based ones. And uh, because of the uh, pandemic, but also before we had the virtual tours, these are the virtual audiences. So they approach us, not visiting us, but they can come from anywhere, from nearby or from far away. They can come from all around the world. So we have hybrid types of public. So they, they match the virtual access with the presence-based access. We have intermittent audiences. They come and go, they fluctuate. And there is this deep reflection that I saw in the materials and in the book as well about uh, considering the ones that do not come, the audiences that never come to visit us. So let us talk about this and let us talk about the challenges regarding this. So there is this reflection that seems to be, well, something that the uh, Latin American museums pay attention to, that is the uh, disability. So our institutions, how can they adapt and adjust to welcome uh, the uh, public, the disabled people, people who cannot walk, people who have, you know, some sort of visual difficulty, people who are, you know, hearing impaired, people who have issues with memory. So today there are programs in Colombia, for example, and also in the United States, and they really show this concern for this type of audience. We have to open up spaces and how the museum can do that, you know, open up space for the elderly, for the disabled people, for the Alzheimer audiences, uh, people who face other difficulties, for example, emotional difficulties so that they can move around in this public space. So this is very much important. It is a very important reflection that the museums need to recognize because there are 400 million people in developing countries with some kind of difficulty. Uh, only in Brazil in 2012, there were uh, 1 million people that were recognized with some uh, deficiency and uh, very few museums were prepared to receive this public. And what does it imply? It implies that it's necessary to conduct several transformations, sometimes physical. In the discussion, it was shown the difficulty to adjust the areas of the museums that sometimes are in big buildings that are also uh, 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 cultural assets. And sometimes they to adjust them is something very complicated. Uh, and here there are several several contributions in the book that I can name here some of the problems that are put in that are put to discussion in the book and in the platform. But for example, for uh, specialized workshops, for example, it's important to recognize the richness of the discussions and the ways that they were elaborated. Also, the questions that were made by museum directors or cultural managers, proposing questions uh, in a very rich way for you, for us to rethink how to have access to the non-public, those that are that are not used to going to museums and that sometimes they think that they don't go because they don't like, when we know that uh, liking it or not is something that our social uh, status uh, uh, implies, you know? Sometimes we see that we have some, we understand that we need to rethink about it so that we can create bridges to those that do not come to this kind of uh, institution. So the audience, the public that was also discussed in these events is the implicit audience, the, 
explicit audience is not an objective uh, uh, public. It is the way that institutions imagine their public to be. So what is that created for? This has been uh, uh, pretty much debated in the meetings of the museums of Sao Paulo, but the museums have several devices that discipline the visits that restrict the public uh, that is not going to go beyond the, that lane, is not going to touch the, the piece of art. So in this condition, based on to whom the museum is designed for, is that we create our institutions and that we establish that some public uh, feel that they belong to that place and others feel that they don't. You know, like I've mentioned, the public that have uh, the disabled uh, uh, people, for example. So, for example, a museum that does not have a ramp to access all the floors of the museum or that does not have electronical devices for those that are uh, uh, um, have some uh, eyesight hindrance or any problems uh, for them to relate to the content with the communication or information devices. These devices, they make the public welcome or not. So sometimes the behavior of the people from security has implications that make, for example, children not to feel welcome or teenagers not to feel so welcome in the museums. And that reinforces somehow in some of them the feeling of belonging and the feeling of exclusion. In this journey through the richness of the materials, uh, what calls my attention is that it was not, we did not discuss enough the topic of women inclusion. How does this discussion that started in the beginning of the 80s, based on the work of Guerrilla Girls, uh, that made us aware of how the art for several gender reasons exclude, diminish, and make it not feasible to women. Uh, and I think that has been discussed in some of the meetings too, but not only regarding women, but uh, 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 transsexual and other gender options and the ways that the collections, the exhibits, and the curatorship, uh, the payment that is made to some as opposed to others, puts the institution again in an exclusion factor. So if we think what meant the museology revolution as of the 60s, it was questioning within the museology itself, the way that museums access this public, the, this implicit public, and based on them, uh, make some sectors feel welcome and represented and others don't. We see how can museums started questioning more and more this vision of what means to involve uh, representativeness spaces and memory and identity spaces for some sectors, especially dominant ones, white ones with more financial resources and less all the other resources, such as in this case, the gender. I said that there is a huge richness in the methodological discussion as well. Uh, once museums start to recognize this paradox and starts to understand the role of the institution museum to reproduce this inequalities, museums start to have a report on experiences of the Mu Sao Paulo museums that uh, it seems to me very rich. There is an investment, uh, 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 there is a movement 
from the employees uh, on how the self-criticism advanced as the museums have as spaces of exclusion. And there is an advancement, although slow, in the design of methodologies, a concern on how to establish strategies that not only bring new publics to the museums, but, and here I, I think there's something very rich, is that the recognition that the museums themselves need to transform themselves in this process. Some of them detected and decided to, to go to other public spaces, like uh, going to distant communities that do not have this geographical uh, nearness and this need that we need to go outside. And then we started to report experiences of the work uh, on the other side of the walls. Uh, and this work on a, on a first step is seen, first of all, as a social dimension, as something pretty much included by the idea of the democratization of the culture, of taking the culture to communities. And we can see that how much this uh, evolution of this work outside the walls represented by the book and the platform can transform the museums and how can by generating more polyphonic visions of what these collections are uh, beyond the walls uh, materialize in a different way and and take other resources to start the art based on the daily experience of the people. And then we question ourselves, what are the impacts that these actions beyond the walls uh, uh, have on the museums, you know? Do they help represent these people that are excluded? Are they represented in the permanent collections and in the temporary collections? I think that this was a central topic in the Anthropology Museum National Museum of Mexico that brings the history of the 20th century, and especially in the 70s, especially uh, included, uh, embedded with this uh, criticism that search in different ways to take part of this collection to the communities that were considered non-public. However, uh, one thing, one criticism that I could think of based on my reading of all these uh, materials from Sao Paulo is that these experiences of the museum did not have, in fact, any impact on the National Anthropology Museum. Yes, they had based on thinking the role of the mu community museums, but we could not see the synergy that Brazil and the museums of Sao Paulo had thought about. Which ways the museums can start changing to take these practices to, to expand this uh, uh, in exclusion practices? inclusion practices. So I think that we should surpass the monological view, the discussion to think about polyphonic uh, institutions, these polyphonic institutions that will transform themselves based on the recognition of their different publics and the relationship with these publics that are not only there as consumers, but as active cultural creators with whom the museum has to dialogue. In one of the events, uh, Martin Grossman's proposal was presented to think uh, of a museum as an interface. I think this is very rich because this makes the museum see itself uh, more and more, not as a container of a collection of works of art and sculptures and pictures, you know, or any kind of material resources, but that thinks more and more how this museum is going to be built. 
and that combines more and more with this materiality in several possibilities of action, reflection, and also the, in the field of uh, this virtual world that is uh, having a, an important role in the museums now. So this vision of the museum as an interface, as a bridge that allows for this relationship to be more flexible and more open to think how to change to from the monologue and go to the dialogue. I think that all these reflections are allowing us to see how in the core of these debates is the opportunity to generate mutual cultural comprehension. The institutions have the possibility to think themselves over through the publics and find ways to dialogue with them. And here, uh, the recognition of this challenge, that means the development of the studies of the public. We need to think about them in articulate processes of short and mid range that are gradual and that allow, uh, to allow us to improve the relationship with the current public and with the non-public, you know, I mean, tests like uh, Motoni and Clara highlighted, uh, demands continuous research, continuity and efforts like the one that we're making right now. And also the evaluation of feedbacks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your very careful reading and deep reading of this uh, sources that the book brings us uh, in its content, in its narrative, but also these relationships that the nature that the nature of this partnership between CISENG, the system of museums of the state of Sao Paulo together with Acam Portinari and the permanent forums allow this reference, this relationship with other sources, be them of the Forum Permanente, permanent forum, or the system that is operating and, and that is being maintained by a state policy. So these readings are very attentive in the sense that they understand that this policy exists, that it needs to be maintained regardless of all, of all the problems. And uh, even Motoni made this very clear, the, the fragility of these public policies, especially the pu public ones, uh, in face of a world uh, under transformation. I don't want to be too long because we have Renata Mota, and I see that we are almost, it's almost uh, 12 o'clock here in Brazil, and we need to finish in 30 minutes. So, Renata, wouldn't you like to make some considerations and then we can open a debate between our speakers. And then if we have time, we can try to answer questions. Uh, in the meantime, those that are attending the session can send questions to IEA respond r e respond at usp.br okay so if we have time we're going to answer questions uh, from the audience okay and once again uh, thank you very much for this very rich contribution that these two powerful women have given us in this moment uh, Matching, thank you, thank you. And I would like to tell you about how happy and honored I am to be here representing so many colleagues that participated in this process and this uh, meetings in Sao Paulo specifically, but also in all this building of the state policy of museums. And then we can go back in time much more. But uh, in fact, I just would like to tell you how honored I feel to be representing you here 
and I feel a little bit, I feel so good now because I am here with Angelica that is also a very a fundamental representative of this process and a supporter through a Campo Chinari from the beginning uh, of the meetings of uh, Sao Paulo museums. And of course, congratulate uh, uh, Martin and Forum Permanente, the Permanent Forum, for uh, doing this, uh, for preparing this publication that is bringing us an incredible possibility, not only to revisit all this process and these achievements, but uh, to open this to be debated. And now I would like to highlight, especially the panel today, that was something that Martin insisted on. And it was very important, not only because of the, the speakers that gave fantastic speeches with this great panel of women, with three women that I admire very much, Clara Camacho, uh, for all the closeness and the relationship that she has with Brazil and with Sao Paulo particularly, but also as a permanent inspiration in building this state museum system, Mutoni, that is fixed on my behalf in the national committees and uh, uh, that has, uh, this meeting has only happened in this uh, virtual context, but uh, uh, we are having uh, an opportunity to dialogue a little bit closer. And also this proximity with uh, the University of Sao Paulo and IEA, that also here I would like to include Professor Ari, that Martin already knows how dear my relationship with uh, the University of Sao Paulo is and how happy I was to collaborate in the restoration of the uh, Museum of Sao Paulo. Well, I just wanted to react here and turn back to you with a few questions. And I think that's what Martin expects. And I believe I may contribute. I've been highly impacted by the three excellent speeches. As uh, Clara said, we did not agree on what to talk about, but they were highly articulate with a great deal of convergent points. And that's very much important, right? For the kickoff. Well, let me talk about convergence. Of course, there is this uh, shared concern, concern, sorry, in understanding that the Sao Paulo Museum uh, meeting is a fundamental piece in this uh, policy that has been structured uh, for the uh, Sao Paulo Museums in a continued fashion. But we are always amazed. Uh, well, we are actually fearing the possibility of uh, seizing this uh, project because this is also part of the public policies in the global south, especially in the Latin American context, because uh, we are more in touch with this uh, context. So we are always reflexive on the issues, on the questions that could lead to a possible interruption of this project. But we have to see those as permanent challenges. These are challenges that are posed in this a context of deep changes, deep changes in society. But also we have challenges in the uh, museum sector. So Anna Raza was speaking about this. She spoke about some milestones, some discussions that we've had in the uh, museology field. We know that in the Latin American context, we have this historical discussion that started in the 70s, discussing in that case, the social role of the museums. And then recently, everything has become accelerated and also the uh, debate in the museological field also followed the same pace, the same fast paced changes. 
our panelists, they brought three elements. And I think it's important to readdress them now. The first is connected to social inclusion. Anna Rosa has really focused on this in her presentation. And this is in connection with what Clara said about the cultural democracy, right? So there is this link between democratizing a culture and the cultural democracy. And uh, Mutoni drew our attention to the impacts, the local impacts, and the relationship between the museums and the local development. Well, uh, overarching questions, and then the uh, panelists, they all addressed uh, these matters and established a relationship with the publication, with the book. But in addition to that, I would like to provoke you with uh, three facts, three things uh, from my perspective of interest as well. And then I'll, you know, let Martin moderate as he feels uh, appropriate. Then he can, uh, you know, address the questions to any of the three panelists. Or we can have this open dialogue. I imagine, you know, there are questions coming from the audience as well. Well, one of the aspects is that the importance of designing policies is relevant up to the uh, results of such policies. But I would like to hear from you about the core of that, that is the implementation. Because I think that there are underlying factors in the implementation that will pose the difficulties in terms of the continuity of the public policies. That's the initial point uh, that was shared in terms of the uh, concerns. Uh, so implementation. And uh, Ana Rosas addressed, you know, the design of methodologies, for example, uh, outlining strategies for that purpose. So Ana Rosas, I really liked your reading. Well, the technical group of the uh, State Museum Group, they pay attention to the processes much more than to the uh, materialities. So they pay attention to the connections. So I would like to hear from you about this, about this uh, challenge to think about the continuity of uh, policies or the specific policy for the state of Sao Paulo. And all of that has to do with the uh, reduction of effectiveness of the policies themselves. Another point that I would like to provoke you with is what Clara mentioned. That is the challenge of doing assessments, especially in our own contexts of the global south. So we do witness, you know, fast-paced transformations. And as we do that, we see the risk. We see the risk of reduced interest of the governors, the, the political leaders. They feel more resistant to embracing deeper reforms because they break the linkage with the past. And we see that happening more often. So after the uh, fire of the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro in 2018, there was this uh, executive order that was passed by the federal government to uh, create a new agency with a new model and remove the powers from the previous agency. And this had not been discussed with anyone. So it's very typical. It has to do with the bureaucratic processes of the uh, government agencies, but it also has to do with the crisis moments that we are experiencing right now. I think this risk is related to the assessment, the, to the uh, dimension of assessing. Because how can we demonstrate our impact and our relevance? This is what we are discussing here, right? Do we have structured data so that we can fight against the exaggeration, the exaggeration of the agency actions that we are prone to very often? And the other point, the third point, is very much related to something that Mutoni mentioned, 
the governments should see culture as part of the social and economic development of a certain country. It's important to have this perspective. We know that there are many debates related to this, to this theme, but I would love like to draw your attention to something that is also related to the development of networks and the development of the state network of the Sao Paulo Museums more specifically, that is uh, focusing on the inter-institutional dialogues. I think that the publication, I think that the book uh, presents a, a broad set of themes. And I think Ana Rosa and Clara, they also spoke about the dialogues that we have with the academia, with the many spheres. The uh, Sao Paulo management system is a public private model of management, and it has to do with many dialogues that are established. But we don't do an intersectoral dialogue. We don't promote such dialogue. So in view of the current challenges that present themselves to the museums, in trying to establish a dialogue with the society demands as well. It's important to address this as a provoking question to you for our discussion. Well, without further ado, I wanted to highlight my provoking remarks based on the richness of the uh, contributions. And I'm truly thankful because it has to do with my journey as well. I spent uh, six years working for the Department of State Culture, and I was trying to build from within. That was my role. So uh, my first task about the implementation was implementing such processes. Just to give you an example, and I'll close. The uh, state museum system had been in place since 1986, and there should be a board that should have been formed, but this had never been implemented so far uh, until 2010, until 2011. This had not been implemented, so it made the entire process fail. So just to close, yesterday uh, there was an update on the executive order that included a seat at the ICOM Brazil in this very board for the museums. So this results from our dialogues in our journeys. So we are able to intertwine this cooperation network to devise the public policies. And as all of you have said, and I know that Clara paid attention to that. You all talked about the long-term building uh, policies. They are developed for a long-term uh, effectiveness. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Well, now um, we decide what to do, Renata. So the floor is open. The floor is open to the panelists, Anna, Clara, and Mutoni. Feel free. I think I will begin. Well, it's always hard to say the first contribution. So Renata uh, brought to us three major questions and it could take us additional two hours, but I don't think we have all that time. So I'll try to synthesize and I'll try to make uh, my contribution based on my experience. So Renata, thank you for addressing the issue of implementation. Because between the designing of public, public policies and their implementation throughout their cycle, very often the uh, states that have to do the implementation, as you said, well, they have to work from within, as you said. It's a quite slow work. Very often it's a quite slow work. It requires a great deal of negotiation with the public sphere. It requires a great deal of motivation from the uh, professionals, from the civil servants or employees of the agencies that are engaged in, in these uh, agencies. And throughout the process, there should be analytical assessment. There should be some sort of assessment to be made before and after the implementation of the process. So the point that you raised is sometimes something that is invisible. 
it, it comes to the fore, but it's on the very surface. We analyze the big idea of creating, of devising a certain political policy, a certain political measure. And after this is passed, and there are many examples in, in Portugal. And then this is an element that belongs to a legal document, for example. For example, the um, articles of incorporation of a certain institution. And then we have to wait so many years up until we see the implementation, up, and see, up until the implementation can be reliable enough. And in my experience, this is only uh, possible when there is an understanding between the uh, political leadership and the technical leadership, which is highly important as well upon the implementation of public policies. So this was my first remark. My second remark now, well, in the sphere uh, of the dialogue of the global south, because it's highly interesting, right? When we speak about Europe, uh, Portugal is in Europe, right? And uh, Portugal is aligned uh, with uh, Portugal, Italy, Spain, and Greece that are the countries of the south. Uh, well, we suffer prejudice from the north countries and I'm talking about museology here. I'm not talking about anything else. Well, based on that, it's quite interesting to analyze the assessment methodologies and how we can apply those in our museums, in our geographies. Because most of the uh, studies, especially the studies on the social impact of museums, they result from other areas, they result from other geographies with rare exceptions. So they usually come from the north. They usually come from English speaking uh, countries. And not always uh, can this uh, be transferred to our realities. So we pay close attention to this, especially in our project, the project that I'm leading right now dealing with the cultural and social organizations, including many research projects. And I mentioned the work that we are doing in uh, Catalonia with their Association of Museums. So I was able to support their work with the local governments. It was not an assessment instrument, but it enables the uh, development of a self-assessment. And it's quite interesting, quite innovative. And it also enables us to verify the responsibilities of the administrative agencies, the administrative authorities. This is rarely assessed. And without further ado, this is what I had to say. I would have so many other remarks, but uh, uh, I really liked the presentation on the audiences. This is something that really moves us. And I really liked the way you addressed them, the issue about the audiences and the public. Thank you very much. So Anna, I saw you raising your hand. Anna, you muted. Yes. In spite of the richness and diversity of topics that we have identified, I believe there is a topic that is cross-sectional that has to do with all of the topics. Dialogue requires infrastructure. That's what I think. And in acknowledging this, we have to promote the uh, dialogue infrastructure. And this is what the Sao Paulo Museum effort uh, brought about. I have to congratulate you on promoting this space for development, for building, for promoting the social fabric, 
in the sector, which is fundamental, right? And I agree with uh, Clara when she says that the information infrastructure requires a system that is aligned with the information generation, that is aligned with the assessment of the system and of the different audiences. We shouldn't just think about uh, developing the meetings themselves, but we have to set the grounds and we have to develop an information system that is uh, made at the state level and at the national level to be able to nurture the efforts and to be able to use the theoretical and the methodological debate. And also this will enable us to identify the, and address the uh, transformations of the Brazilian society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ana, for your remark. Mutoni, would you like to say anything? Sure. You have um, the floor, Mutoni. Thank you very much. I think that um, in terms of assessment, there are two types of assessment. The self-assessment, which would be within the profession, and then there's the external assessment, which is related to the audiences we exist to serve. The external uh, assessment also has the element of government and government policy, especially if they're funding the activities that uh, the heritage and cultural sector or museum is uh, participating in. Of this, I think the most important is self-assessment because this is where you try and see where it meets or agrees or responds or speaks to the audience assessment. Because if we think we're very good, or you think the 10 years have been very good, but the public doesn't think so, then there's a disconnect. So I, I really, but I, I like, I admire the idea of assessment. In terms of the um, implementation of the policy, um, for example, in Kenya, we've created a very complex system. Previously, we had a system where the, the museums had um, what people would call boards or advisory institutions or advisory committees. But then it was realized at point, uh, it makes things very bureaucratic because the, the museum, a particular museum, say the Nairobi National Museum had an advisory board, which then reported to the board at the headquarters, which then reported to the ministry. So that was scrapped. And I can hear that uh, in San Paolo, you're going more towards that direction, which of course is very interesting for me because uh, we just scrapped that in Kenya because we didn't, we said it doesn't work. But now we created a system that includes public participation, which is even more complex because public participation is obviously going to be very, uh, like Anna was talking about, very methodological. You just can't wake up one day and invite the public. You have to segment them. You have to make them available if, for example, you're asking them questions. So it presents certain challenges. But I believe if we work out methodologies and strategies for this kind of uh, engagement on policy, we will still be uh, attain a level of success. Thank you. Bom, é, eu acho que nós estamos chegando ao final. Eu queria muito que talvez. Um, uh, well, tanto... we're about to finish, so I would like Ana, Clara, and you, Matoni, could uh, give your final considerations. I would also like Hinata to contribute because I think this partnership extends uh, to several fields. So I think that it's important that Hinata mentions how many people are behind this network. And it's uh, almost a galaxy because there are different clusters, different units that organize themselves to to have this whole, you know, to make this whole 
that generated the book. With that, I would like to reinforce uh, uh, my thanks to Renata, uh, to all these different teams that formed this constellation, mentioning the importance of the individual uh, in the maintenance of a policy uh, to maintain a structure of museums like those we have, like the ones we have in Sao Paulo and in Brazil, in a situation that is very urgent or extraordinary, that is not only due to the pandemic, but the pandemonium. You know, the, the, this, these two things that are uh, impacting in some parts of the world and uh, especially here in Brazil, that we have the pandemic and the pandemonium established, although we have, we are very successful in the vaccination, especially in Sao Paulo, that has mitigated the situation that we faced in the beginning, that we also faced, you faced also in Mexico. And Mutoni probably uh, did not follow the same situation in Africa and in other places. But I think that in different places, the impact of these two things has caused uh, several difficult situations. But it's important to highlight here that uh, this exchange of ideas and of evaluations is very important of these issues that have been placed, the merits, uh, but also the, the fact that we need to look, Clara mentioned clearly, the issue of the assessment. Uh, state policy without an assessment is not a state policy, and we know how difficult it is to conduct that in face of a structure where the government policy prevails. So an evaluation is also much more important to be conducted by external bodies, but that requires money, resources, and also a follow-up that is not always possible in face of the changes and the transitory uh, aspect of the teams. So it, as a result, the, what the book shows is that we have the structure in Sao Paulo and that it has these characteristics that are very uh, important that Clara also mentioned on during her, her speech that come from other uh, people that are present in the book and she also added others that are fundamental for us to think uh, over later. And with that, I would also like to thank the teams that are involved in this transmission, in this communication. And I thought it was important to that your comment and uh, that the dialogue requires an infrastructure. So in this case, we are exchanging WhatsApp here with researchers in the forum. We mentioned that, you know, we could make more of these international meetings once everything now happens virtually. But we know the difficulties that we face to organize a meeting like this, be it uh, due to the agendas or time zones or even with a minimum financial resource that allows us to have this online transmission with the simultaneous translation. So with that, I would like to thank, but I'll give you the floor. But uh, before that, I would like to thank the translators this morning, a very a team of powerful women too. So we have Gabriela, who's the supervisor. We have Mati and Julia, Carmen, and Silvia that uh, have been here with us ever since we started the session and that worked very well. So I would like to thank the technical team from IEA that allowed us to make this transition possible and the other teams, be it from CISEN, a Campo Tinari from the Permanent Forum Permanente, Permanent Forum, and the, the Institute of Advanced Studies that allowed us also to have this structure. Now I will give you the floor so that you can make your final considerations.
Thank you very much, Martin. I think that you have connected everything very well, uh, bringing all the important uh, aspects. I like the analogy with the galaxy that has all these different dimensions and a, an endless number of people that relate to, that are they have a relationship with this network. And I think it's very important to mention uh, the Addition, the, the current crisis in Brazil, that is a crisis of several dimensions and that has been making us reflect a lot as citizens and as professionals from museums. And I think that this is an important event as uh, personally, I believe that these structures that are constituted in these network dimensions in a participative way uh, and in a sound way, in fact, bring us, go through crisis periods like this in a smoother way so that we don't go back, you know, even more. So, and they are structures that are important in this perspective in a crisis moment. And finally, uh, I would like to mention again how happy I am to be here exchanging knowledge and learnings and you talked about the difficulty of organizing events like this, but they are real, but they are also important with regard to sharing experience uh, in different contexts that bring us other reflections and other dialogues, but especially in terms of exchanging ideas that can unfold into very good initiatives. Now I'll give the floor to our speakers. Okay, we will start with you, Anna. I, I would like to congratulate the effort to transform what was one of our, our main difficulties in this uh, world of culture, that is this monological approach and generate all this polyphonic uh, approach and I think it's a speech that's going to remain not only in the museums of Sao Paulo, but in others. And I think that centuries of this work will be seen in all Latin America. So congratulations. Yeah. I would also like to congratulate you. All all the team that was uh, involved in the organization of this uh, meeting today, but also all the team that is related to the state system and the leadership, all the professionals. It's a fantastic work. You was with a lot of curiosity and with a lot of learning that we uh, achieved this communication, great communication that led us to think uh, uh, about other things, about not only my reality, but about other realities too. And also, just like Anna mentioned, it's an example, it's a model here in Sao Paulo that uh, in its dimension has possibility to be repeated uh, and replicated and foster dialogue in other areas, in other parts of the world, including Portugal. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate um, your sharing of the book with us. And I hope I can share it with my colleagues in the heritage sector in Kenya, uh, because it, it really presents very interesting and very challenging points that we can already start to interrogate. I thank Clara and Anna for their perspectives because some of their points just are eye-openers for me as a practitioner in Africa, 
just like probably some of my perspectives, they're like, oh, really? Is that so? So I really enjoy that because it creates possibilities for further communication. Uh, thank you, the permanent forum for this, uh, this sort of discussions and putting them on a global platform in spite of the challenges. Uh, but I think uh, technology has its advantages, which uh, wouldn't probably before all the chaos, we would have thought about physical meeting, which becomes a bit more complicated. So there's always a, a bright light in every dark space because now it's created the possibility for us to share all this globally and virtually. So thank you very much. And I hope to meet so many of you in different professional forums. Thank you. Wow, então, um tchau. Well, so, bye-bye everybody. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs>